Short Papers. Section 3. Two Impossibles. By Charles Henry Mackintosh. Better known as C.H.M. Hebrews 6. There are few who have set out to follow the Lord Jesus who have not, at some time or other, gone through painful exercise of heart in connection with the opening verses of Hebrews 6. While, in the long run, they have no reason to regret the exercise, yet it is always needful to distinguish between the spirits using a scripture to search us, and Satan's abusing it to stumble us. Searching is good for us. It is most helpful. We all need it, and we have to be thankful when we get it, but we are so prone to be light and superficial and to retire from anything that probes the conscience. Still, we have not the slightest doubt that many true and earnest souls, many to whom Hebrews 6 verses 4 through 6 has no application whatever, have been stumbled and discouraged through not understanding the true force and bearing of the passage. It is to help such that we pen the following, for we can truly say there is no work in which we have a more intense interest than in taking the stumbling blocks out of the way of God's beloved people. We feel most fully assured it is work which he delights to have done inasmuch as he has given express commandment to his servants to do it. We have just to take care lest, in our desire to remove the stumbling blocks, we should in any wise disturb the landmarks. May the blessed Spirit graciously help us to a right understanding of this sadly misunderstood passage of Holy Scripture. So we inquire who are they of whom the inspired writer speaks in verses 4 through 6, those of whom he declares, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance? A correct answer to this question will remove much of the difficulty felt in respect to this portion of Hebrews. In reaching this answer there are two things to be borne in mind. First, in verses L and 2 there is not a single feature belonging to Christianity as distinct from Judaism. Secondly, in verses 4 and 5 there is not a single expression that rises to the height of the new birth or the sealing of the Spirit. Let us quote the Apostles' words, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, or as the margin reads it, the word of the beginning of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms or washings, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Now it must be plain to the reader that the apostle could never exhort those professing Hebrew Christians to leave anything belonging to Christianity. There is not a single fact in that glorious economy from first to last, not a single stone in that glorious superstructure from foundation to top stone, not a single principle in that magnificent system from beginning to end, that we could afford to leave or dispense with for a moment. What is the grand foundation of Christianity? The cross. And what are its two characteristic facts? A man glorified in heaven and God dwelling in man on the earth. Could we leave these? God forbid. To whom or to what should we go? It is impossible that we could leave or give up a single fact, feature or principle of our glorious Christianity. What then are we to leave in Hebrews 6 verses 1 and 2? Simply those elements of truth contained in the Jewish system which, in so far as they possessed any permanent value, are reproduced in Christianity, but as a system were to be abandoned forever. Where is there a word unique to Christianity in this passage? Can we not see at a glance that the apostle has Judaism before his mind? it is this he exhorts his brethren to leave and to go on to Christianity which he here calls perfection. It is a commonly believed idea that the words let us go on to perfection refer to our leaving the earlier stages of the divine life and getting on to the higher. This is a total mistake. As to what is called the higher Christian life, there is, in reality, no such thing. If there be a higher life, there must be a lower one, but we know that Christ is our life, the life of each, the life of all. There cannot be anything higher than that. The merest babe in Christ has as high a life as the most matured and profoundly taught member of the Church of God. There is progress in the divine life, growth in grace, faith growing exceedingly. All this we own most fully and would charge ourselves to seek after it most earnestly. But it is not the subject of Hebrews 6 verses 1 and 2. It is not a question of going from one form in the school of Christ to another, but of leaving the school of Moses to enter fully, heartily and intelligently into the school of Christ. It is not a question of going from one stage of Christian life to another, but of abandoning Judaism to go on to Christianity. We could not abandon a single atom of Christianity without abandoning Christ himself, for he is the foundation, the source, the center, the spring of it all. But the reader may feel disposed to ask, have we not got repentance, faith, resurrection and eternal judgment in Hebrews 6 verses 1 and 2? See note. True, but only as elements of the Jewish system. There is not a word about faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, not a word about Christ at all. 
it is simply Judaism, to which some of the Hebrew professors were in danger of returning, but from which the Apostle earnestly urges them to go on. Note. Resurrection, as seen in Christianity, is not merely resurrection of the dead, but, resurrection from among the dead, end of note. Let us now turn for a moment to verses 4 and 5. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, of the coming millennial age, if they shall fall away, to renew them again to repentance. The reader will notice that, as in verses 1 and 2, we have not a single clause specially characteristic of Christianity. Also in verses 4 and 5, we have not a single clause that rises to the height of the new birth or the sealing of the Holy Spirit. A person might be all that is here spoken of and yet never have been born again, never sealed by the Holy Spirit. How many thousands have been enlightened by the gospel without being converted by it? Wherever the gospel has been preached, wherever the Bible has been received and read, an enlightening influence has gone forth, altogether irrespective of any saving work wrought in souls. Look at the nations of Europe since the Reformation. In all those countries that have received the Bible, we see the moral effect produced in the way of intelligence, civilization, and refinement, apart altogether from the question of the conversion of individual souls. On the other hand, those countries which have refused the Bible, exhibit the depressing results of ignorance, moral darkness, and degradation. In a word, there may be enlightenment of the understanding without any divine work in the conscience or in the heart. But what means the tasting the heavenly gift? Does not this imply the new birth? By no means. Many have gotten a taste of the new, the heavenly things set forth in the glorious gospel of God, and yet never have passed from death to life, never have been broken down before God about their sins, never have received Christ into their hearts. Tasting of the heavenly gift and passing, by new birth, into the heavenly kingdom, are totally different things. Also many were made partakers of the Holy Spirit so as to speak with tongues, prophesy and the like, who nevertheless were never born of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, His presence pervaded the whole assembly. His power was felt by all, converted or unconverted. The word rendered partakers does not express intelligent fellowship. This makes it all the more clear that there is not the slightest thought of new birth or sealing. Further, as to tasting the good word of God, do we, not all know too well that unconverted people can in a certain sense enjoy the word of God and have a measure of delight in hearing a full, free gospel preached? Have we not often heard persons who furnished no evidence of divine life, speak in highly appreciative terms of what they call the savory doctrines of grace? There is a wide and very material difference indeed between a person tasting the good word of God and the word of God entering the soul in living, quickening, convicting and converting power. Finally, a person might taste the power of the coming age, the age when Messiah will set up his kingdom. He might heal diseases and cast out demons, he might take up serpents and drink poison, he might speak with tongues. He might do all these things and yet never have been born again. Thus, as a recent writer has solemnly and forcibly put it, we may fairly give the fullest force to every one of these expressions. Yet, write them out ever so largely, they fall short both of the new birth and of sealing with the Holy Spirit. There is everything except inward spiritual life in Christ or the indwelling seal of it. One may have the very highest endowments and privileges in the way both of meeting the mind and also of exterior power, and yet all may be given up and the man become so much more the enemy of Christ. Indeed such is the natural result. It had been the mournful factors to some. They had fallen away. Hence renewal to repentance is an impossibility, declared to be so by the authoritative and conclusive testimony of the Holy Spirit, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Why impossible? The case supposed is not anyone who ever possessed a single spark of divine life in his soul, no, nor yet anyone with the very feeblest desire after Christ or one atom of true repentance or desire to flee from the wrath to come. The cases of persons, after the richest proof and privilege, turning aside as apostates from Christ, to take up Judaism once more, as long as that course is pursued, there cannot be repentance. Supposing a man had been the adversary of Messiah here below, as for example, Paul himself, the very writer of the epistle. There was still the opening for him of grace from on high. It was possible that the very man that had slighted Christ here below, might have his eyes opened to see and receive Christ above, but this abandoned, there is no fresh condition in which he could be presented to men. 
those who rejected Christ in the fullness of his grace and in the height of his glory in which God had set him as man before them, not merely on earth, but in heaven as attested by the Holy Spirit sent down from the ascended and glorified man on the throne of the majesty in the heavens, what was that to fall back upon? What possible means to bring them to repentance after that? There is none. What is the but Christ coming in judgment? Note. Lectures Introductory to Paul's Epistles, by W. Kelly, End of Note. For one who, from amid the full blaze of gospel light and privilege, could deliberately go back to the darkness of Judaism, there remains nothing but hopeless impenitence, hardness of heart, judicial blindness, and eternal judgment. It is not, be it carefully observed, a child of God falling into sin and getting at a distance from God. Such an one will, most surely, be brought back and restored, though it may be through sore affliction under the chastening hand of God. It is not an anxious soul earnestly seeking the way of life and peace. It is not the case of a poor soul ignorant and out of the way. To none of these does the impossible of Hebrews 6 verse 4 apply. There is not a single anxious, earnest soul beneath the canopy of heaven whose case is impossible. There is just one case that approaches awfully near to Hebrews 6 verse 4 and that is one who has gone on sinning against light, refusing to act on the plain word of God, knowingly and deliberately resisting the truth because of the consequences of acting upon it. This is indeed most solemn. No one can take it upon him to say at what depths of darkness, blindness, and hardness of heart, a case of this kind may arrive. It is a terrible thing to trifle with light and to go on with what we know to be wrong because of worldly advantage, to please friends, to avoid persecution and trial, or for any reason whatsoever. Give glory to the Lord your God before he cause darkness, and before your feet stumble on the dark mountains, and while ye look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death and make it gross darkness, Jeremiah 13 verse 16. Having sounded this warning note for any whose case may need it, we close this part of our subject by presenting to any troubled soul whose eye may scan these lines, that precious word at the very end of the inspired volume, a word issuing forth from the very heart of God and the heart of Christ, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Let us now look at other warnings and consolations. In reading the epistle to the Hebrews, we can hardly fail to notice the way in which the most solemn words of warning stand side by side with words of deepest comfort and consolation. Thus, for example, Hebrews 4 opens with let us therefore fear, and closes with let us, therefore, come boldly. When we think of who we are, what we are and where we are, we have reason to fear. But when we think of God, his grace, his goodness, his tender mercy, his faithfulness, we may cherish the most fearless confidence. When we think of the world with all its dangers, temptations and snares, we may well be on our guard. But when we think of the throne of grace with its exhaustless provisions, and of our most merciful, faithful and sympathizing high priest, we can draw near with holy boldness and find an ample supply to meet our deepest need. So also in Hebrews 10, we have the same striking contrast of the warning voice and the sweet words of comfort and encouragement. Hearken to the former. If we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses, of how much sore a punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and has done despite to the Spirit of grace? For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs to me, I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. How awfully solemn is all this! How searching! Should we seek to blunt the edge of the warning? God forbid! We should only see that it has its true direction, its proper application. Can it ever touch an anxious inquirer or a true hearted, earnest follower of Christ? Assuredly not, except indeed that it may deepen the earnestness of the follower and quicken the pace of the inquirer, for only see, reader, how close the word of comfort and encouragement stands to the awful note of warning and admonition. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. 
for yet a little while and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back to perdition, but of them, that believe to the saving of the soul. Thus we see how the inspiring spirit connects, in this epistle, the most precious consolation with the most solemn warning. Both are needed and therefore both are given, and it will be our wisdom to seek to profit from both. We need never be afraid to trust scripture. If we find a difficulty, instead of puzzling over it, let us quietly wait on God for further light, meanwhile calmly resting in the assurance that no one part of the word of God can ever contradict another. All is in the most perfect harmony. The apparent discrepancies are entirely owing to our ignorance. Hence, instead of putting forth our gratuitous efforts to reconcile things, we should just allow each passage of scripture to come home in all its moral force to the heart and conscience, and produce its divinely appointed result in the formation of our character. Read such words as my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. It is our sweet privilege to take them in, in all their divine simplicity and heavenly clearness, and rest in them in calm confidence. There is no difficulty, no obscurity, no vagueness about them. All Christ's sheep are as safe as he can make them, as safe as he is himself. The hand that would touch them must touch him. They are divinely and eternally secure. Persons may imagine or profess themselves to be his sheep, who are not so in reality. They may fall away from their mere profession, bring much reproach on the cause of Christ, cause the way of truth to be evil spoken of, and lay a stumbling block in the way of honest inquirers by leading them to think that true Christians can fall away and be lost. All this may be true, but it leaves wholly untouched the precious and most comforting words of our good and faithful shepherd, that his sheep have eternal life and shall never, can never, perish. No passage of Holy Scripture can, by any possibility, contradict the plain statement of our Lord. But then there are other passages designed to search the conscience, to make us watchful, to produce holy circumspection in our ways, to lead us to judge ourselves, to induce self-denial. Take the following weighty and most searching scripture, Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all, but one receives the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beats the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9 verses 24 through 27. Now, will anyone attempt to place 1 Corinthians 9 in opposition to John 10? Far be the thought. What then? We are simply to receive both in all their divine force and allow them to act upon us according to the divine purpose in giving them to us. The latter on our hearts for comfort and consolation, the former on our consciences for admonition and warning. How terrible it would be for anyone to say or to think that, because he is a sheep of Christ, he may walk in self-indulgence since he can never perish, that he need not seek to keep his body under, but may give loose rein to his desires, because nothing can separate him from the love of Christ. Surely such an one would afford most sad evidence that he is anything but a sheep of the flock of Christ. But we must return to Hebrews 6 and dwell for a moment upon our second impossible. The first, as we have seen, had respect to man, the second has respect to God. Man, with the very highest advantages, with the very rarest privileges, with the most powerful array of evidence, will turn his back upon God and Christ, he will deliberately apostatize from Christianity, give up the truth of God go back into darkness, and plunge into a condition from which the Holy Spirit declares it is impossible to renew him again to repentance. But as usual in this marvelous epistle, the strong consolation stands in close and most gracious proximity to the awful warning. And, blessed be God, this same strong consolation is designed for us in connection with the very smallest measure of living faith in the Word of God. It is not a question of great attainments in knowledge, experience or devotedness, no, it is simply a matter of having even that measure and character of faith and earnestness pictured by the manslayer as he flew to the city of refuge to escape the avenger of blood. How precious is this for every true and earnest soul! The very feeblest spark of divinely given faith secures eternal life, strong consolation, and everlasting glory, because it is impossible for God to lie. He cannot and will not deny himself, blessed forever be his name. He has pledged his word and added his oath, the two immutable things. 
where is the power, human or demonic, that can touch these two things? We close with another quote from William Kelly, from his lectures introductory to Paul's epistles. Another point of interest which may be remarked here in Hebrews 6 is the intimation at the end, compared with the beginning of the chapter. We have seen the highest external privileges, and they were merely external, not only the mind of man, as far as it could, enjoying the truth, but the power of the Holy Spirit making the man an instrument of power, not a subject of grace, even though it be to his own shame and deeper condemnation afterwards. In short, man may have the utmost conceivable advantage and the greatest external power, even of the Spirit of God himself, and yet all come to nothing. How solemnizing! But the very same chapter which affirms and warns of the possible failure of every advantage, shows us the weakest faith that the whole New Testament describes coming into the secure possession of the best blessings of grace. How consolatory! How truly encouraging! Who but God could have dictated that this same chapter should depict the weakest faith that the New Testament ever acknowledges? What can look feebler, what more desperately pressed, than a man fleeing for refuge? It is not a soul as coming to Jesus, it is not as one whom the Lord meets and blesses on the spot, but here is a man hard pushed, fleeing for his very life, evidently a figure drawn from the manslayer fleeing from the avenger of blood, yet eternally saved and blessed according to the acceptance of Christ the very lowest character of faith met by the very fullest, richest and most permanent blessing. There was no reality found in the persons referred to in verses 4 and 5, though so highly favoured. Hence, as there was no conscience before God, no sense of sin, no clinging to Christ, that everything came to naught. But here, in the end of the chapter, there is the fruit of faith, feeble indeed and sorely tried, but in the light that appreciates the judgment of God against sin. Hence, although it be only fleeing in an agony of soul for refuge, what is it that God gives to one in such a state? Strong consolation, and that which enters within the veil. Impossible that the sun should be shaken from his place on the throne of God. And it is as impossible that the very least and weakest believer should come to any hurt whatsoever. The weakest of saints is more than conqueror. Well, may we exclaim, in view of all this surpassing grace, Hallelujah! Beloved Christian reader, May our whole life be spent in praising our ever-blessed and most gracious Saviour God.